Warning. World Worry Podcast occasionally discusses mature themes and uses colorful language. There's still so much we don't know about the forces at work on our own planet. Sometimes the only way to learn is to experience it. And while we go on living our lives normally, we allow ourselves to forget or ignore the terrible and fantastic forces of nature that inevitably terrorize us, that lie dormant. Welcome to World Weary Podcast, a podcast all about the weird and woo-woo or absolutely fantastic things that you usually keep to yourself. Hosted by two wonderfully weird women. That was the W's. <laughs> I'm the American one, Cassie Bay Walker. And I am the British one, Violet Star. So, yeah, uh, world weariness this week. Gosh. <sighs> That's just, I just, just a big breath and a big sigh. And um, this is a special episode because we have a very big secret and we're going to reveal that big secret at the end of the episode in a, in tarot time but don't go skipping ahead okay just just enjoy the episode you know sit down and listen to it and you it'll be more fun it'll be brilliant if you just wait until the end to listen uh, to our big secret it all makes sense and curiosity killed the episode <laughs> Yeah, I've been moving house, moved house. Stressful, but there have been some moments of smoothness where things yeah. worked out. And you're the proud owner of a new sparkly pink mini vac that I am super envious of. Yes, I did put it on Twitter. I, I don't know. I'm living out my Barbie fantasy. It's great. It's like, why not? I can like hoover up like spiders on the ceiling and it's going to help with, you know, something we're going to talk about next yep. week, I reckon. Well, I'm going to mention it now as well. Oh, yeah, sorry. Because I've already put some stuff on social media about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. We've put some pictures. We have got I've got a little fairy cabin uh, mm -hmm. that was discovered at the end of my garden. Exactly. And we are going to do it up into our own fairy cabin. We're going to redecorate it, uh, give it some TLC because like, the roof needs mending and it needs yeah. like a lot of little repairs and turn it into a fairy cabin made by adults with a lot of time on their hands. So that's going to be interesting. We're going to... I'm really excited. We're going to like document it with little progress photos, maybe a couple of videos. Already the neighbourhood cats have moved in. <laughs> uh, so that's going to be interesting. <laughs> Trying to get, mm -hmm. keep them out. We're having rays of sunshine amongst yes. the, the storm. Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling really good though. I'm having fun with the podcast. I'm having fun like writing up stories every week to try mm. and like get a reaction out of you and like uh, <laughs> sort of like make you laugh. Creative projects are great to distract you from the It's nastiness. really like the mission of the podcast. It's like we're to trying to distract ourselves with some, <laughs> you know, it's a bit escapism me, yeah. but it's good. Like we need that. But we're learning a little bit about history. Not everything's just about, you know, this or that. Yeah. I I'm, I'm feel like I'm... Giving myself a chance to explore things. It's a again. very enjoyable... Yeah. Uh, frolic. Yeah. Frolic into strange history. Yeah. I'm very privileged to have been born in a time where I can do this. Yeah. Rather than Isn't having that interesting? to toil in the fields every day. <laughs> or my great aunt, who supposedly was toiling in the fields while pregnant, had her baby, and then an hour later was back on the fields. <sighs> Those were the days. Gosh, dust bowl era. So this week's episode is just like our lives about natural disasters. Specifically volcanic eruptions. Mm -hmm. I can't say we I've ever experienced volcano stuff, so I've learned a lot this week. Should we get into stories? I was going to say volcanoes. Did we know any volcanoes? Was if you ever had any great friends with volcanoes? I when I lived in Japan, Oh. Of course, that was pretty cool because I was like, oh my god, I'm on a volcanic island chain that's yeah. like got like active volcanoes and stuff in the sea and like epic mountains and stuff and earthquakes. <laughs> like where I lived was like kind sort of, of scary close. scary and awesome. Yeah, it was close to one of these like 
earthquake cracks or whatever. Ugh. And I mean, I was obsessed with Pompeii yeah. when I was a kid. Watched every documentary mm. I could find. Oh God, yeah, it's like archaeology, like heaven, holy grail. It's just so cool. Yeah, there were so many earthquakes in Japan. That was pretty like crazy. I was like, whoa, like you really feel the earth. Yeah. As a completely different personality to the like <laughs> sli- slumbering giant of like England. It's like <laughs> over there, it's like no shit. The ground fucking moves. There is fire and fucking mm. tsunamis and fucking typhoons and shit. Like I had no idea the amount of disasters and like man. When the Tone River burst its banks, oh shit. That we had. I think it was like to do like a massive like storm surge oh, right. and a huge typhoon so i didn't realize that a typhoon is basically a hurricane yeah yeah like it always sounded smaller to me <laughs> just i think it's to do with the pacific ocean oh. or like a particular bit and like hurricanes is just the name for so- mm. a kind of massive cyclone in a different sea or yeah. like a different area no, they're no joke. No, that was insane. Like, you were literally... I would literally be trapped in my little apartment for, like, weeks just playing games because of the typhoon. <laughs> but the Tone Rivers is massive. Like, the town I was in was, like, right on the uh, estuary of it. Oh, wow. So, so it was, like... Oh, my God. It was, like, a very, like, seaside... We were in a big industrial port city in the countryside. And it was just, like, insane. Like, we were watching at school on the TV... And just like old people, like holding onto their roofs oh, no. as their entire no. houses were like <gasps> swimming along in this massive no, s- surging so river. Scary. It was insane. Like people died, and yeah, there was a big earthquake. That, like threw me out of my bed, and I was sleeping on the floor in a futon. Like, and it threw me out of bed. That's how powerful that would be it was. So scary. It was insane. And then, of course, I think just as I was leaving. There was a uh, Sakurajima, which is like Cherry Blossom Island. It's a pretty famous yeah. volcano. I think is active now. Yeah, it had an eruption and it was just like, whoa, like <sighs> it's a very exciting geography lesson, Japan. Yeah, it's scary as well. Like, mm. oh dear. If anywhere's pre- prepped for a natural disaster though, Japan. Yeah, they're like, they're quite on it. Sirens, drills, like everyone is trained to just jump under the table. <laughs> Everyone's got survival packs and stuff like that. They're, they're well trained. <laughs> they're ready. They are. <laughs> no, it's a far cry from like, you know, maybe you've got your flashlight gear. Like my parents had a good hurricane set up, you know. I feel Americans either take it to one extreme or the other. So like completely <laughs> unprepared. Yeah. And like no, my parents were pretty prepared and we lived in a house level. that survived tornadoes, yeah. hurricanes, floods, everything. Do you have a basement full of preserves? They have like <laughs> pantry. Ooh, full of shit. Preserves. Preserves. Preserves is how we'd uh, say it. Preserves. Where says preserves? That sounds is that like, like up north? north. Yeah, like Wisconsin sounds, yeah. or something would say preserve. Yeah, that sounds very specific. Or maybe that's from a film with mm. Diana Keaton when she moves up in the country and starts making Jam. Baby food. I've, really, I've pre- never watched freezer. this. Okay, no, okay, I just like, okay, never baby mind. Baby food. Well, fuck. Cut it out. Who wants to watch a movie him. about a baby food manufacturer? Well, she starts, okay, so Diane Keaton plays this lady who's like too busy in the city and she doesn't give a shit, but then her friend dies and leaves her. She's the godmother, so she has this baby all of a sudden. She moves to the country and has to leave her big city job. Ends up in this farm and, of course, turns it into a small business because she's so business-oriented and city-like. Ugh. But she learns how to live in the country and there's a romance side plot. Anyway, so, nine, 1980, mm. March 27th, Washington State. Washington. All the way up northwest, Seattle, Britain of America, rainy, cloudy. I have a good idea of where this is now. Uh... uh- <laughs> <laughs> where Twilight is based in. Okay, like pla- plaid shirts. <laughs> plaid, yeah, plaid shirts. Uh, lumberjack people. Wood beavers? No. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay, corn dogs. <laughs> <laughs> is it corn dog territory? I think all of America. I really want to eat corn a corn dog. dog. I really want a good corn dog. I'm going to have to just learn the recipe. And do the best we can. Mm. There's okay. We're gonna introduce you first character here, real people. Sorry, like just in my little story, mm. Kathy Anderson and her tree planting crew. 
They're up on the mountain, Mount St. Helens, when they hear and report what they think is a small explosion. They think it's people illegally stump blasting. In Ah, actuality. Stump blasting. It's Mount St. Helens, a small eruption in the 126-year dormant volcano. It opened a 250-foot wide crater in the summit. Fuck. So the United, I mean, the American United States Geological Survey, the USGS, gets wind and Don Swanson, geologist. Oh, Don Swanson. Uh, what is it? Ron Swanson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I just now, I'm just going to imagine Ron Swanson. It's not far off. If I showed you a picture, it's not far off. Okay. So geologist extraordinaire, top in his field. I'm talking people internationally would want him to identify their rocks. Okay. Okay. So he flies to Portland, Oregon, a mere 50 miles away from the summit. They begin setting up observation equipment more so than what they had on there before. David Johnson is also part of the super crew of scientists they've gotten together last minute when they've heard of this small eruption. In interviews by news crew, David Johnson expresses his concern, quote, that an eruption may be likely very soon. Johnson and Swanson. So this is the part of the movie, like Volcano or Dante's Peak, where shit's getting down. All the scientists are being flown in because they're the experts. People are like the the. We you're gonna have what's to, that thing called? I'm shaking my hand. The stenograph or yeah, uh, what is it called? It's bouncing around and yeah, they're like, yeah, they're, oh my god, their instruments are going crazy. The and someone's on their got like a 1980s headset thing. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, people are, like, going on the Seaboard ra- CV, CV radio, like, shouting. And, and a crazy. Jeep, like, sp- yeah. pulls up, like, speeds. Exactly. Spins up a load of dust and, like, someone yeah. comes out in hot pants. Yeah, the U.S. Forest Service closes the top of the mountain. So they're freaking out. Let's close the top of the mountain. And the people nearest to the summit mm-hmm. are evacuated. There are loads of tremors. So, the go- like, I mean... Like Old Faithful on the mm. hour, Tremors. So the governor of Washington declares a state of emergency. They're doing all the things they're supposed to do. Sweet. So in times of the, the governor has announced it as a state of emergency, they're like, please stay off the mountain. It's very volatile and dangerous. So what do people do, Violet? They uh, stay on the mountain <laughs> and they are brandishing their like guns and like hamburgers and stuff and a corn dog and planting a little flag and refusing to move. I, well, I don't know what you have an idea in your head about Americans, but no, we go even one step further. People t- from everywhere start showing up like it's a tourist attraction. It becomes a, a rave. <laughs> yeah, like it's a eruption rave. rave. People are sneaking in. There's some interviews with some smug people. They're like, "Yeah, I asked the forest ranger how what they were doing to prevent people from going in, and then I used that information to get in." <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Like really smarmy. I mean, there's an interview that made me rage out on um, minute by minute Mount St. Helens. Check out that documentary on YouTube, guys. So mm. television crews, helicopters, terrorists. Shit's happening all day. Dickheads everywhere. But then, you know, the hullabaloo tremors happen every day. Weeks go by. Weeks go by. And of course, everyone's like, eh, it's all going back to normal for the local yokels and everybody. Mm. And there's a bulge. Unbeknownst to anybody but the scientists, Uh, there's a bulge forming at the top of the mountain. A David Bowie in the labyrinth forming. Yes. Caused by magma not being able to move freely, so it builds up like pus in a wound. Ew. And what does that wound, what does pus in a wound end up doing? Fucking pop it. Ew. So- <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's just going through his puberty, okay? Oh. Leave him alone. Geologists and volcanologists are freaking the fuck out, but to the normal person, nothing seems to be happening. And of course, as weeks go by, normal people are convinced nothing's happening. And geologists manage to convince people in charge that it is serious. So they're working behind the scenes with their information. And they establish a red zone outside the summit and try to evacuate even more people a month later. Harry R. Truman, our hero, a cantankerous but charming mountain man of 50 years, and the owner of the somewhat infamous Mount St. Helens Lodge at Spirit Lake, which is at the foot of the mountain, is stubbornly staying in his lodge becoming a folk hero overnight in interviews. One story to get an idea of his character. 
goes that his second marriage did not last long as in order to win arguments, he would carry his wife to the, to the lake and toss her in even though she could not swim. He was throwing his wife. He was trying to <laughs> drown and kill his wife. <laughs> so he's... During an argument. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, if you have an issue in arguments and you have the strength to take your partner and throw them in a lake if they don't swim, you will probably win the argument. But you may end up with a divorce again. He's fond of whiskey and cola. He has a pink Cadillac. And he swears like a Oh, my God. I need a pink Cadillac. So... He hears all the hullabaloo by the USGS and he begins to turn up on purpose and he gets interviewed and these people, the reporters must have been loving it because he's just basically the same kind of guy that's like, I want you to try to say this bit as like a mountain man. Oh no. Okay. The smaller type. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Got a channel like Gord from yeah. um, Highway Through Hell or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't watched, I'm sure I've talked about that in an earlier episode, but yeah. if you haven't watched those, uh, they're about... Like, people who go around recovering, like, massive lorries and stuff in the cold, Violet snowy bits of Canada. He's the manliest man on Earth. Gord Boyd might be the manliest man. Oh my man. god, he and is actually, I know him. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. and he's, he's got, favorite. he is 100%. I don't know him in real he's life, He's the greatest I, I favorite ever. He's so noble. He's like And he's, so like, cool. handsome, but in, like, a humble, like... Yeah. Every rugged man. like man who's like sensitive he's seen bad times like and the other thing about god is that <laughs> his voice got a is gord fan. so deep it's like the deepest like male it's voice comforting. it's not even it's like beyond that it's like <laughs> his voice the only way it's so deep the only way i can describe it is it's like the like oak planks of like a ancient shipwreck creaking underwater <laughs> like it's that like deep like croak noise he's a he's a man man gord boy check him out yeah why are, are you holding gotta your channel fucking it tablet you gotta oh shit it. that's why okay you guys will understand by the end of this episode <laughs> why we're, we're slightly frazzled the mountain has shot its wad and it hasn't hurt my place a bit but those goddamn geologists with their hair down their butts wouldn't pay no attention to old Truman. That's right. So people love him. They're like, wow, Truman knows better than the geologists. <laughs> he's basically insisting he's not leaving. The mountain's a part of him. He's a part of the mountain and the lake. He can't leave it. And because of his... ever known. Yeah, and because of his blatant sp spitting in the face mm. of authority, people are like, yes, go on, Truman. So the bulge continues to grow. Oh, Truman's bulge. <laughs> There's another song. Up on the mountain, photographer named Reed Blackburn, who's 27, is being interviewed by a man named Ro, Ro Findlay oh, from the National Ro Geographic Fiddly. magazine. Fiddly is not a good Findlay. song. Oh, okay, that's acceptable. <laughs> Fiddly. <laughs> Fiddly? No. Jesus. Findlay. Okay. And he's... They're at Cold Water One, an observation post set up by the USGS. Okay, sounds cool. The ground rumbles and Ro looks <gasps> to, with concern to Reed. Oh, I love a concerned scientist. And Reed just goes, oh, it's just an earthquake, 4.5. Just 4.5? Yeah, just 4.5. Only 4.5? So wow. he's, he's, he's got remote control cameras set up so he can be the first person a mile from the summit to capture anything that happens. Don Swanson and David Johnson, Swanson and Johnson, volcanologists and geologists, opposite, mm -hmm. are taking turns covering their colleague who had to leave at short notice. He's a student and he had a graduate thing to do. So Dave agrees to do Saturday and Don will do Sunday. May 17th, 1988 a.m., a month and a half after the initial explosion, eruption. And the residents are rolling their eyes and they, they all go to the roadblock that the forest rangers set up near the lake. One angry resident in an interview said, we're paying taxes and we like to use our property. I'm not afraid. It's a pretty accurate rendition. Mm. The governor gives them permission, but they have to sign waivers saying, releasing the county from any responsibility should they be injured or perish if the worst were to happen. So now we're going to go to another uh, couple Venus Durgan, a post-70s name, mm -hmm. a 20-year-old, and her 19-year-old boyfriend, Rold Rattan. Rold Rattan? Rold Rattan. Wow. 
are camping along the south part of the Toodle River in Washington. They decided to have a semi-romantic getaway, and Roald hides a bottle of champagne under everything in the cooler so Venus doesn't see it. He's planning on it being slowly revealed throughout the weekend as they get all their snacks. Oh, that's nice. They park their 1968 Oldsmobile Delta Custom in the forest and set up for a wonderful weekend of camping. Original hipsters. Original hipsters. They're like, yes, we're underage, but we've got a bottle of champs. So, meanwhile, David Alexander Johnston, 30 years old, a volcanologist working for the USGS. We mentioned him before. He's the one in the interview who was a bit concerned. He's a brilliant and enthusiastic young scientist stationed at the new observation post called Coldwater 2. Back to the forest crew, Kathy decides to do something out of the ordinary with her hippie tr- tree planting crew. Okay. Hippies and the trees. So Kathy and the hippies, they're planting trees all over this goddamn mountain. And they're like, well, let's go closer to the summit. Like, they're like, let's go to this area. It's May 18th, 1980, 8.32 a.m. And a 5.1 earthquake happens and a fracture in the mountain begins. Oh, shit. The mountains shake. The geologists at their stations watch their seismographs go nuts. 25 seconds after the earthquake, an explosion occurs and ash is spewed 12 miles into the air. David Johnston, our volcanologist, radios into the USGS office in Vancouver. His transmission is as follows. Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. And then the radio goes dead. Two miles north, Jerry Martin, a volunteer observer for the state, is broadcasting on his radio situated on a ridge with a view of the mountain. So he's got a view of cold water too. Now we've got a big slide coming off the west, he reports. Now we got a great big uh, eruption out of the crater and we got another one opened up on the west side. From his vantage, he could see the USGS cold water too become destroyed by the slides instantly. He relays a final transmission. The whole northwest section, uh, north section blowing right up into the air. It's coming up over the ridge towards me. I'm going to back out of here. Jerry Martin is never heard from again. Mm. So, yeah, he's taken out, but he manages to report about cold water, too, also being destroyed by the slide. The northwest side of the mountain disintegrates, dumping rubble into Spirit Lake and the lodge where Harry was. So Harry's gone as well. Mountain man's gone. Mm. Lightning, volcanic lightning is fucking everywhere. At cold water one, Reed Blackburn goes to jump into his car to get away with his cameras, but the ash is too fast and he's suffocated while getting back into his car. Kathy Anderson's crew is trying to get her tree planting hippie crew out of there because they hear the, you know, they know Mm. what's going on. If they'd been any closer, they'd be devastated. But if they'd stuck with their original plans to be on the north side, they'd be dead already. Okay. So because she changed up, they're still alive. A bit of good luck. So they're trying to climb the slope back to their vehicles. Kathy orders them just to dump the baby trees and stuff and run. Shit. They wait for an evacuation plane as lightning is all around them going nuts. Oh, fucking... The ash, which is scalding hot and going down the mountain at 300 miles an hour, is heading toward them at a crazy rate. And they can see it happening and they're like, just stood there waiting for a plane. So meanwhile, the landslide is heading toward our romantic couple. (laughs) it's just horror after horror all right so so they hear a loud siren and they know what it means because that's not good yeah if you hear a siren anywhere that is not good times i used to hear it during floods and hurricanes and stuff and tornadoes so it's a warning siren they jump in their car but it's already too late the toodle river is all around them engulfing them so they literally are in their tent one mm. second, they hear the alarm, they go out, and they're surrounded by logs and water. Mm. They uh, have to get out of their car. So they tried to get in their car, but it surrounded them. And they get onto the top of the car, but they have nowhere to go. So they have to jump in. And Roald and Gina, Venus, Roald and Venus jump out of the car into the swirling mess of lumber and debris. Roald managed to get purchase on a large log, balancing himself. But he watches with horror as Venus goes under, slipping between massive logs, oh, being pinned. Shit. So underwater, she's slowly being crushed. She can feel her bones being squished, and she can feel her wrist threat- threatening to break. 
she lifts her hands as best she can out of the water. Like her fingers mm. can get out of the water and she's waving them. And he doesn't see it for a second. But when he finally does, he's like trying to grab at her hands and he can't grab her properly. And he just ends up grabbing whatever limb and hair. He grabs her by the hair and rips her. Oh, um, fuck. Watching helplessly as he's trying to pull her out and logs peel her skin off her face and arms. Oh, man. This is... That's painful. Ugh. Like, that is horror movie stuff. Yeah, like, so these logs are basically time, pinning like, her. And oh, he's trying no. to, like, grab her from in between, like, mm. these two logs. Like, mm. what's the comparable thing? Like, in a factory, like a squeeze. Yeah, like yeah, I know what you mean. squeezer or something or whatever. Ugh. So, cheese squeezer. Okay, like so, a rolling pin. Yes, yes. So he finally yanks her out of the cheese water squeezer. and onto a log, saving her life. Mm. They manage to ride the logs, basically surfing the logs for a whole mile until he gets them to a bank. Relative safety. The problem is she's severely injured. Her skin's torn off her face. Her wrist is smashed. Her forearm is stripped to the muscle. And she's going into shock. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you do. So he knows they have to keep moving. So he's just like, let's keep walking. He describes the walk as hell. Oh, as they man. walk through a debris-ridden forest full of ash blowing into her wounds and his it's like a fantasy horror movie it like can you imagine it like, is hell darkness is hell. and like the air, very it just air. feels like mordor. the end of the world walking through burning mordor oh. like there's a big volcano explosion in that we got almost yelled at by a bunch of nerds when we saw the final lord of the rings film and after that bit where they're being carried by the eagles. Mm. Spoiler alert. <laughs> they get carried by the eagles. Yeah. And Frodo's all, like, his lips are all fucked up and yeah, yeah. chapped. My dad just went, get that hobbit some water. He, like, shouted it in the theater. And we had a bunch of beardy some very nerds dad. turn and go, shh. Inappropriate <laughs> dad jokes. Yeah, I know. In the middle of a theater in the biggest film of the fucking year. Get that hobbit in a some day water. when you had to wait a little <laughs> while, like unless you wanted to download a really shitty one off Kazaa, you had to wait for the DVD or the VHS, mm. you know. So yeah, it's fucked. Kathy Anderson and the hippies are looking for spotter planes, watching as the ash hurtles toward them at 300 miles an hour. A colleague starts to run away, crazed and mad. <gasps> they grab him and have to beat him up to subdue him and throw him into the van. They're quite in an 80s fashion. Kathy sort of laughs about it when talking about it. <laughs> Sweet. So they're told on the radio. They, you know, they finally get radio mm. contact. No planes are coming to rescue them. They will have to somehow find a way out. That is when you know it's bad. It's when they can't help you anymore. It's like, you, you're on your own, guys. Good luck. It sucks. They all had, they, they are basically, their only plan is to find this bridge that they can hardly see because everything is going to fucking shit. On the other side of the bridge... As they start to convoy, a truck stalls, and it's left behind. They start to radio Kathy, and Kathy is such a fucking decent woman. She, like, comes back. They fix the fucking truck as Ash is heading toward them, and fucking continue the convoy. And Heroine. manage. She manages to get them to safety. Hard nut and fucking so We've got to go back. No one left behind. No hippie left behind. I would like to pair her up with uh, God Boyd. Yes. Ooh. Romance. <laughs> <laughs> so the eruption lasts for hours, but Kathy and the hippies are safe. Rescue workers are searching for people, but they can't recognize any landmarks making rescue even more dangerous. People... Working in a rescue helicopter somehow managed to find Roald and Venus and transport them to the hospital. Venus has all her wounds scraped for ash while she's like slightly drugged up, but they don't like, they slowly give her more medicine, mm. but like she has to have them scraped twice because the doctor didn't think they got enough ash the first time and it has to be completely ash free before they even oh, start to help her. Jesus. Before she can even go that into surgery. That sounds and stuff. stingy. It, she said she fucking was in a lot of pain. So in the hospital that night, she watched the eruption on the news as the hospital rumbled. Although she and Roald would eventually break up, Venus has nothing but nice things to say about her ex-boyfriend and is forever grateful that he saved her life. What an experience, though, to share together. Oh, like, yeah, like you're bonded for life in a way. Yeah, Especially like even after you break up, lots. you yeah. kind of are always going to be thinking like they are... That's their legacy. They exist and they also were the only other person that 
saw but what that romantic hellscape. plot you could end it before they break up yeah. but you could end it with them being like in each other's arms like maybe it was their first week in away he's like nervous with the champagne mm. now you can make a whole movie about that yeah literally where's the venus and her name's venus and shit just <sighs> you know what though the whole time we i've been listening i've been thinking about a movie that i want to see which might not exist but i want to see a movie with sandra bullock and renee zellweger as a volcanologist and geologist like right now driving around in a little jeep with the hot pants and boots plays like a really cynical just about the science one and sandra bullock plays oh maybe they're like lovers as well we're in this world now maybe yeah (laughs) well i just want i'm imagining more just like very mature Women. I'm just trying to say maybe Renee Zellweger is like the it's slightly quirky one. I would like one, a female friendship Bullock's movie. Is, yeah, she's like super scientist lady, and the, she's like the serious one. And Renee has been sent to help her. Maybe she's a bit weird and quirky and does things her way, mm. and they have to work together to solve something before solve the volcano the eruption. volcano erupts and kills yeah. everybody. That is the movie I want to see. I don't want any children involved because that's my most hated predictable thing: is the kid running off or doing something inappropriate or... And you're just yelling and you're like, no, I'm sorry, but... No. Finding a musical toy and pressing it just at the moment that everyone's hiding from the dinosaur. <sighs> but yeah, so yeah, when Roald's brother looked for the Oldsmobile later and he found it and the only thing that survived was the champagne, they later drank the champagne and Roald said it was the best he'd ever had. It was doubly sweet because it represented their survival. survival. The eruption at Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980 claimed 57 lives, including David Johnson. Oh, who man. So I really was a hero because yeah. he was at Coldwater 2 Those still getting who, the yeah, information. They didn't abandon post, no, you know? No, he like... stayed there and like it could have so easily been Ron, I mean, Don Swanson <laughs> could have so easily been him because if he had, if David had said, I'll do Sunday, you do Saturday. And so it's just sort of, it's really tragic because they lost their friend and a brilliant young scientist yeah. as well as all the other folk who didn't survive. Mm. But it could have been much, much worse. But because these geologists were on hand right at the start to try and create these red zones and the governor was responsible and tried to do the best he could to warn mm. people, stay off the mountain. They did the best they could. You know, they got them to sign those waivers if they wanted to stay. But a lot of these times the problem is there'll be a little bang and then quiet mm. before the big one. Mm. And people are so easy to be like, oh, don't worry about it. Listen to your scientists. Because every time an eruption happens, like, we learn so much mm. from it. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's in vain if people, like, I don't want it to be in vain people like David Johnson. And, mm. and you know, the it's heroic read stuff. and stuff. Like, like, there's a lot of heroism going on here. But yeah, that that's my story. Uh, it's just... Just really harrowing, really scary. Really to, crazy, really scary, really... The, the quiet mountain that you've spent your whole life hanging around, the, the mountain you feel that's part of you, that lake doesn't exist anymore. Like, the helicopter crews had trouble finding it because all the landmarks were gone. The mountain just disappeared. It's just like that thing of just being in total fear and awe. Yeah. Like the fear of God, like in the Old Testament, kind of like just really like it's so big and powerful. It could just destroy all of you in a moment with no regret. Okay, June 1874. I'd like to start off lots of my stories with the date. Yeah. We are in Martinique. Martinique. Where might that be, Cassie? Maybe it's you the, know. I I'm psychic. I'm psychic. Like, it's, it's, it's in the Caribbean. Yes, French Ca- owned Caribbean. Yeah, it's a French overseas territory. Uh, it's an island in the West Indies, Caribbean Sea. Oh, lovely, beautiful photos. Gorgeous. Would you like to try and describe Just the vibe? This déjà vu of. Gorgeous. No, they're, um, <laughs> it's just really beautiful. Tropical you know, waters. Tropical waters. Everything you imagine forest, about the beautiful Caribbean. Quaint buildings. The French that, you know, period houses. And here's a picture from back in the oh day. My God, paradise. It was known as the Paris of the West Indies. Gorgeous. Absolutely 
green and lush and magical. Okay, I cannot pronounce names from French places. Ludger Silbari, Silbari, something like that, is born on a plantation near a fishing village on Martinique. Silvari grows up and works as a common labourer in Martinique's capital city, Saint-Pierre. Hmm. At the time, Saint-Pierre was known as the Paris of the West Indies, as I just mentioned. Okay, so you get the vibes. It's very French and whimsical and pretty and all yeah. the lovely things about Paris Caribbean and architecture. Boho. Yeah, like very, very Caribbean boho. According to most of the sources on him... He was quite the troublemaker as a young man. He was frequently arrested or, like, known to get into fights. Mm. On the night of the 7th of May, 1902, so he's about 27, 28 years old, you know, it might have been a typical evening out for him in Saint-Pierre. What exactly happened isn't clear, but the most common story is that that evening, Silbury got involved in either a bar fight or a street brawl and was thrown into jail overnight for assault. So he gets locked up. Oh, Silbari. Some accounts claim that Silbari wounded a friend of his with a cutlass. Some say he actually killed a man and was thrown into jail for murder. Some accounts state that he had a precognitive dream <laughs> and got locked up as a drunk after causing a riot. But that's probably from a fictional account. Yeah. Basically, uh, he got into some kind of trouble and he got arrested. Silbari was ordered to be put into solitary confinement and locked in a... He must have been done something bad. Yeah, in a, in a probably grotty as fuck, poorly ventilated, smells bad, underground cell. They basically threw him in the dungeon of the prison. The next morning, probably waking up feeling like shit, like sick and your head spinning and it's almost 8am. It's breakfast time at the prison, if you got breakfast back then. <laughs> Making me recall my hangover moments of eating pizza in bed. Uh, so he's in this like painful ass solitary confinement cell underground in the big old prison. There's not much light. There's a little grate, like a tiny slot on his cell door. Mm. And then he notices suddenly that everything has gotten really, really bloody dark. <laughs> Even from within his solitary confinement cell, he would probably have been able to hear the panic and shouting in the rest of the prison. And it starts to get really fucking hot. Damn. Really hot. Seven. He notices really hot, smoky, ashy air coming in through the door grating. It's pitch black. He's getting scolded by heat inside the cell. He takes his clothes off and he starts to pee on his clothes. And then he stuffs those clothes into the door to try and minimise the heat. Uh. Doesn't fully work, but it helps. The skin on his whole body uh. starts to burn as he desperately tries to not breathe in the scalding hot air and ash that is filtering into his cell. But, okay, it was it was over in a matter of minutes. Those minutes probably felt like 300 Hours. years. Jesus. So, the town of Saint-Pierre sits in the shadow of Mount Palais. And that morning, the upper mountainside of this volcano had literally ripped open in a Ugh. massive volcanic eruption. A dense cloud of pure black volcanic shit shot out horizontally <laughs> from the mountainside. Oh, no. Then a second black cloud travelling at 420 miles per hour <laughs> rolled, <For 20. laughs> rolled up from the mountain creating a gigantic mushroom plume made of burning hot ash and rock. Is that what you want? It darkened the sky within a 50 mile radius. The mushroom cloud then collapsed down the western slope of the volcano moving at 100 miles an hour. 
So we're talking... No one's got it. No. No time. No time. <laughs> we're talking rocks, ash, lava, insanely hot gases, over 1,000 degrees centigrade. The pyroclastic flow. Ugh, that's what you don't want. Covered about eight miles of land. And it took less than one minute to destroy the town of Saint Pierre. Just it's like fucked it up was a gone, minute. gone. Nothing was left. The whole city was flattened and burnt. Almost the entire population of Saint Pierre died from suffocation or burning. In total, around twenty-eight thousand people died. It was the worst volcanic disaster of the 20th century. Four days after the eruption, a rescue team heard Silbari's cries from the rubble of the prison. Although badly, badly fucking burned, he had survived and, you know, was able to share his story. Jesus Christ. How did Ludger survive? I mean... Remember that poorly ventilated solitary confinement yeah. cell? By fucking luck. That cell, like the shittest place to have been <laughs> before the eruption, was essentially the best place to have been. Like, it was a bomb-proof bunker. Stone walls built partially underground. The cell did not have windows. It only had that narrow grate ventilating it. Uh, in the door that was facing away from the volcano. His prison was also the most sheltered building in the city. <laughs> and the cell in which he survived still stands that today. Do you want to freaking see, if it see happens that? Again, that's where you want to go. It's like one of the only things left from you that go there entire and you know what, eruption. You know those anti-fire blankets? Maybe if you wrapped one of those, you might not burn so bad. Yeah. If you were in that place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Depending on how it goes, you know, like, but yeah, shit, it sucks. Several hours after the eruption, the acting governor of Martinique sent a warship called the Suchet to investigate what had happened and the warship, uh, and the warship arrived off the burning town at about uh, 1230, you know, midday. It took several further hours before it was even cool enough for them to land on the shore. Because, like, literally everything was boiling and burning. Jesus. Like, the shit would have just, just caught on fire. Yeah, like, everything is fucked. Like, completely burnt. In the afternoon, they made it to Batin. Or Batin. Uh, I don't even know. They made it to Batin. <laughs> what had been a famous... Tree shaded square with cafes and stuff like the cute bit in the yeah. center of town. They said not a tree was standing. Like the trunks of the trees were just like burnt off, ripped apart, like just torn out by the roots. Jeez. The ground was littered with dead. Fire and a suffocating stench prevented any deeper exploration of burning ruins. So many of the victims were in casual attitudes. Ugh. So they were just calm and Time they didn't think. even, like, it It just killed them without any warning. Like, they just died. Um, oh, imagine but the, the percentage others... of people on the toilet when it happened. That would be the worst. That's why in Japan I learned you always need to have your clothes ready or a dressing gown ready if you're having a shower. Yeah. Because if there's an earthquake while in the shower, which there could be, you yeah. need to run outside, and do you want to be that naked person? No. Yeah. Other people that they found were contorted in anguish, because oh. that's not a nice way to die. The clothing had been, like, torn from most of the victims who were struck down outdoors. The, some of the houses were just, like, squished. They were, like, just gone. Ugh. Like, there's like they were never there. Even, you know... People who were familiar with the city couldn't even find any landmarks left. And the city burned for days. Ugh. Days. That's when it's just smouldering. Slowly, like bit by bit, like rescue parties and like clear up people managed to like get into the ruins, but it took a long time. They, there's so many dead bodies. They just Ugh. couldn't bury them all. So many people just lay like dead under the ashes. Like really bad and they couldn't 
retrieve any bodies. Lots of them were just they couldn't even identify. Really fucked. Fucked <laughs> and so sad. There were very few other survivors in the town. The problem was is that like they did rescue pit parties did find people alive, but they didn't tend to live very long after they were found. Like Oh really? It, when they found people they were generally in real bad Third shape. Third degree burns and shit. Like yeah, really, you know. Really burnt. Uh, one survivor was a shoemaker whose house was on the very edge of the path of the pyroclastic flows. Lucky. Uh, here is his account of how he survived, and it's pretty disturbing. I felt a terrible wind blowing, the earth began to tremble, and the sky suddenly became dark. I turned to go into the house, with great difficulty climbed the three or four steps that separated me from my room and felt my arms and legs burning, Ugh. also my body. I dropped upon a table. At this moment, four others sought refuge in my room, crying and writhing with pain, although their garments showed no sign of having been touched by flame. At the end of ten minutes, one of these, the young girl, aged ten years, fell dead, and the others left. I got up and went to another room, where I found the father still clothed and lying on the bed dead. He was purple and inflated, oh. but the clothing was intact. Crazed and almost overcome, I threw myself on a bed, inert and awaiting death. My senses returned to me in perhaps an hour when I beheld the roof burning. Jeez. With sufficient strength left, my legs bleeding and covered with burns, I ran to Font Saint Denis, six kilometers from Saint Pierre. Imagine fucking running after almost dying and yeah, watching just like a house full of people burn. <laughs> you imagine the floor is burning and the <clears throat> roof. You wake up and you're just like, "Oh, I'm still in this burning fucking building, yeah. dying." <clears throat> Another survivor was Havivra de Ifril, a young girl like ten years old who ran from the eruption, got into a boat rode to a cave down the shore and survived because she got washed out a mile out to sea. But she, <laughs> was, she was unconscious, but it's just insanely lucky. A lot of people were out at sea on boats and, of course, survived. Like, some of them had to literally witness their town and everyone they knew and love Jesus, die. They, would they have watched seen it, all. it all happen and Jeez. everything f just gone in a couple of minutes. That's, like... How do you go on? And, of course, lots of the people who were rescued live after the eruption died of their injuries. So really sad. In the aftermath, a passenger steamship that had been thought missing turned out it had actually reached the port of Saint-Pierre just half an hour before the eruption. Oh, so they just finally made port. And then it was like, boom. Sorry. <sighs> The pyroclastic flow set the ship on fire and most of the crew and all of the passengers died, uh, except oh. two passengers, a little girl and her nanny. That was one fucking good <laughs> nanny. Like, I want to see that movie. Super grand. Let's yeah, see that fucking movie really of cool. like Mary Poppins versus a volcano <laughs> on a steamship. Sandra Bullock can play uh, yeah. Mary Poppins. Yeah. Don't know any children actors. What are the feelings? Yeah. So what's really sad and why we should be very grateful that we live in a world of crazy computer technology mm. and volcano experts is that now, of course, we can look back and see all of the telltale signs that there was going to be an eruption. You know, it was all there like at least a week or two before it exploded the top of the mountain off. For a long while, there had been some smoky shit coming off the mountain. <laughs> April 23rd, 1902, 15 days before the eruption. People hiking up the mountain noticed plumes of sulfurous vapours spewing out of the mountain top. Small tremors were experienced on the mountain. There was a light rain of cinders from the mountain. All normal here. yippity yay yay Always rain cinders. Nothing, nothing weird about that. April 25th, 13 days before. The mountain top emitted a large cloud of ashen rocks that did not cause significant damage. It's only a light, a light, <laughs> light ash storm, y'all. This is perfectly normal. April 26th, 12 days before. 
an explosion came from the mountainside that caused the town to be covered in a fine layer of dust. The authority said there was no reason to worry. It's all right. It's all good. Don't be afraid, man. Don't Don't, be afraid. Don't be afraid. (laughs) April 27th, 11 days before. Excursionists. Um, What a fucking word. Um, We're saving that for future use. (laughs) <laughs> excursion. Just taking an excursion to the off license to buy some <laughs> tinnies. They climbed the mountain for fun, basically, and they go up to this big caldera, which is basically the big, you know, the big classic volcano crater on the top. Yeah. Where you stir the big soup inside. <laughs> they got there. throw the ring in it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what we're looking at. It's full of water. Okay. Uh, it has formed a giant lake that wasn't there before. That's suspicious. Being fed by a constant stream of boiling hot water and volcanic debris. I don't like when water <laughs> appears in places it hasn't been before. Like you suddenly literally... Normally we go finding water. Yeah. We have to We have to really look for some fresh water. Yeah. It shouldn't just be appearing boiling. You don't want a sudden boiling hot lake full of volcanic debris. In a volcano, especially that's a boiling your first lake. Red flag. There's someone cooking stew. Okay. Just Ask a, Pierce Brosnan. A big stew. People could hear noise like a giant cauldron bubbling deep underground. <sighs> that's what I um describe my <laughs> my job as. <laughs> How obvious does it have to be? Uh, people all over the island picked up on a very, very strong smell of sulfur that was freaking out people and animals. The horses were going crazy. I would like to insert a joke here about uh, your butt, butt volcano. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you now have something to blame it on. It's just it's a the... distant volcano eruption. <laughs> the mountain rivers swelled and rose, carrying massive boulders and trees down from the mountain. Kind of weird. Some little villages near the volcano received a steady stream of ash from the sky. I don't know. Things are not looking great. May 2nd, six days before. Every five to six hours, there were loud explosions and earthquakes. Every five to six hours. I was starting to be, like, seriously worrying at this point. Yeah, I'd be like, whew. A huge pillar of black smoke comes from the mountain top. The entire northern half of the island is covered with pumice and ash. Farm animals start dying because their food and water is contaminated with volcanic ash. Okay, they've been dying. <laughs> they've been dying out there. Do they evacuate people? No. <clears throat> no. <laughs> no, but the local newspaper does postpone a picnic that was supposed to be held on the mountainside. <laughs> you got to be Postponed. Safe, safety for <laughs> Postponed. Uh, in fact, refugees from villages that are closer to the, you know, to the volcano start to cram into the city of Saint-Pierre. They're coming there for shelter and oh, safety. God. May 4th, four days before. Ash fall on the island intensifies. Communication lines across the island are severed. Communication with other islands and boats becomes difficult. You know, because they had, like, radio and electricity and yeah. shit. You know, this isn't that long ago. The ash cloud is so dense that boats are unable to navigate through it. The area is covered in a layer of fine white ash. Some smart citizens decide to flee the city and cram themselves onto steamships and boats to try and get off the island. Good idea. Good idea for those people. (laughs) May 5th, three days before. At lunchtime, the sea suddenly recedes and then rushes back in, flooding parts of the city. That's some bad stuff. Mm. That's like tsunami stuff, like little earthquakes and shit, like doing crazy stuff with the water. You hear about there's a little girl who learned from her teacher that if the sea recedes quick to get away. Yeah. When she went on holiday, and the first thing that happened when they went to the beach was the sea receded very quickly. She started freaking out. She screams across the mm. beach, like, we gotta go, we gotta go. And people believed this little girl. Every She saved a bunch of people's lives. Sweet. And so much so that the town sent her teacher a gift. <gasps> 
crazy is that? that is teach good. the children. Yeah, in Japan, that's like a well-known thing. Yeah. That they, when they, they teach like all kids and stuff at school about what to look out for, for yeah. like what you should do in a natural disaster and to look out for a tsunami after a big earthquake. A large cloud of smoke also appears on the mountain. One wall of the massive crater, so the one that's full of boiling water, is like a giant boiling lake and shit. Yeah. A wall of it collapses, propelling a tidal wave of boiling volcanic mud into a river. It flows down to a sugar factory burying 150 <gasps> people under 300 feet of mud. That night, more refugees from the surrounding area crowd into Saint-Pierre seeking shelter and aid. Then, the volcanic shit disables the electricity grid. Oh no! The whole city is plunged into darkness and no one knows what the fuck is going on and everyone is confused. Loud sounds are heard from within the depth of the mountain. (laughs) His tummy's rumbling. Yeah. <laughs> Getting hangry. That's scary, man. May 7th, one day before. Volcanic lightning. I love the volcanic lightning. So scary. What do you want to take? Something scary and add it to another thing ten times scarier. Double scary. Double scary. When it was dark at night, people in the city were watching Mount Pelee and the craters on it were literally glowing orange red. And you remember these people lost their electricity. Yeah, they're like... So you're, you're living in, like, a constant Mordor <laughs> hellscape. Oh, no. <laughs> Just, no, thanks. People were trying to leave the city, but there were refugees coming into the city to seek shelter. The newspapers claimed the city was safe. The tremors were calming down, so people thought it was easing up. News had reached them of another volcano in the Caribbean that had erupted, and people thought that this was, like, a good sign. Like, they were like, oh, well, the other volcanic eruption has relieved the pressure and, like, sicked out all the lava, so, you know, it's going to cancel out Mount Pelee. Port authorities were refusing people permission to leave the island. That's when it's fucked up. Yeah. Many civilians were refused permission to leave town, and even threatening some with arrest if they did not comply. So they were fucking... Stupid. Not letting people leave. A captain, Marina Leboff, was like, fuck this, and just left Saint-Pierre with only half the cargo of sugar on board. <laughs> you know, and there was like a massive protest at the ports and they were threatening to throw him in jail and he was just like, fuck this, like just zipped on out of there. Dump like the cargo and go. At the last moment. Ludger Silbari. So he survived, and this is our prisoner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And imagine coming out of that solitary confinement cell after those four days, like, burnt as fuck, in a lot of pain. Your whole city is destroyed, burnt to the ground. Literally everyone else died in a matter of moments, and you survived because you're in a solitary confinement cell. Following on from the eruption, his story of survival spread, and it hit the news headlines of the time. He was pardoned of his crimes, and then scouted by Barnum and Bailey's (laughs) circus. The dream! It was clearly the dream. How many times has the circus cropped up? Yeah, we live in the circus. We did escape from the circus, or the toy box. They had him touring America and recounting the horrors of the explosion. (laughs) Every day. Just deal with your PTSD every day. Like, we're going to, like, send you back. Like, they literally... And you know they dressed it up for him to be, like, in front of the volcano. Oh, they did. They did. Uh, He became something of a celebrity in the process, advertised as the man who lived through doomsday or the most marvellous man in the world. I mean, it seems now like, you know, you kind of a weird thing to put in a circus, but that's what they did back then. Storytellers. Um, and also there was uh, an element of the fact that he was, you know, he was very, very injured from the, the eruption. So he was covered in scars and burn injuries. Cu- so coupled with an incredible survival story. Yeah. He, Is he, there a picture he, of this he dude was, Yeah, I've got a picture. I'll show you in a moment. He was also the first black man ever to star in Barnum and Bailey's greatest show on earth, which at the time was a segregated show. 
he could be seen in a replica of a cell in Saint Pierre, making him relive his trauma <laughs> every day. If you that doesn't make your PTSD worse, I'd... Jeez. Silbury died of natural causes in 1929. I mean, basically, when that volcano exploded, it is so famous, and at the time, because it was like 1902. We had radios and electricity. It was like the first time a volcanic, a big volcanic eruption could be so quickly publicised yeah. and appear in the news all around the world. And it educated people all over the world about eruptions and definitely contributed a lot. for people to be fascinated about it. And Absolutely. To and more. to teach people, you know, they learned so much about volcanoes. The city of Saint-Pierre was never fully rebuilt, though some villages have kind of grown up in its place. The estimated population now of uh, the commune of Saint-Pierre is about sort of 4,500, 5,000. Wow. Mount Palais is currently dormant. They always are. There's a picture of Ludgia. Yeah, he's burnt up. They've kind of posed him. Yeah. But it could have been worse. Like you can, you know. But you can see he's got serious, serious burns down the side there. Like really, just can't imagine how painful that would be. And there, of course, is the the cell surviving in the ruins of the prison. What a badass! I mean, just. And then he has to be hungry for four days, always waiting for rescue because the city's burning around him. It's insane. It's actually insane. I just don't ever want to be unlucky enough to have to witness shit like walk through a burning forest like in the middle of an eruption where it's just black and snowy ash and fire Gosh. and burning thank goodness for mild england yeah somerset My hobbit God. land i'm so lucky away from Mount i am Doom. so lucky to live in a country with very relatively very little. It, it took me years to get used to get used to not having to prepare for hurricane season <laughs> like we have flashlights and stuff but like I don't have to mentally prepare for the possibility mm. of, you know, no power for days and stuff like that. Like it was that's why it was so insane for me to go to Japan. I went from one extreme to the other. Mm. The like super safe islands where the worst thing we get is yeah. flooding. To everything that I dealt with, typhoons, uh blizzards. Yeah, plus volcanoes yeah. and super earthquakes. Lots of lightning storms and plus, yeah, earthquakes and volcanoes. <laughs> it's all there in Japan. They have all uh, of them. It's so tower time yeah so okay first up though here's our secret yeah do you want to reveal the big secret cassie the big secret is that my computer died (laughs) and we lost the episode and we had to re-record so this is actually a re-recording so i'm sorry if we we weren't so surprised by each other's stories because we literally just (laughs) did them a couple weeks ago yeah well last Last week, week last week last week so um, we we've also double recorded today. We have recorded two episodes. Two episodes. We drank so a lot so of coffee. Tired. <laughs> we drank a lot of coffee. This is the episode that almost wasn't because. And the worst part is, we're going to read you. Violet took a picture of last week's tarot. Oh, thank, thank goodness! God. Thanks for suggesting that. Uh, whoever it was that suggested yeah, yeah. that we take a photo of the tarot thing, because if I hadn't done that, we would have forgotten what the tarot yeah. was last week, and we would have messed up our tarot experiment. So, look. Okay. The, here's the thing. The tarot was not good news for us last week. Oh, my. And it came true when my computer mm. fucked up, and I lost our episode. We've, I've lost Every everything. podcaster's nightmare. Yeah. But we are learning. It's a learning experience. Yeah. Like, it's a good thing. And now it's better than ever, so, I mean. We're prepared. We are, like, so dedicated. Thanks for... To, to you guys now that we... We make it happen. Yeah, I didn't want, like, I'm, I fucking had to buy an SSD, like, when I'm not in a position. <laughs> okay, so, uh, last week, our tarot reading in the episode that is now missing, which we have just re-recorded for you, uh, the recent past that week was the Two of Pentacles. Yeah, so balancing act and sort of like, you know managing a bunch of different things at once you know either successfully Mm. or you know our present card was mastery or the chariot which is like the rainbow chariot dude he's been he'd been cropping up a lot yeah so chariot you know uh success action determination he's like 
a go getter mm. is grabbing at. The we were go getting the... until the episode until, got you know killed. the future card, which we which happened. The, so the near future card was the very depressing Five of Pentacles, which but is a... upright. This yeah, time. upright, and it basically is like failure. They were all upright. Like, bad times, really shitty times. It's just like, and I was like, not trying to take it seriously here. Let me see. Uh, So yeah, uh, it's not a great card to get as it's sort of like hardship or negative circumstances. And you may feel like the world is against you. And I had a lot of bad things happen every single day. And then the computer just, my, my mm. drive just fried. It mm. stopped working. I don't have any of the files that were on there. I'm talking some files that I needed. Yeah. It's it was a shitstorm. In a career as far as the podcast, it's it's not a good omen. It can represent losses, you know, things like that. It's extreme negative, you know. It can mean financial ruin and shit. Oh, you know, shit. be careful when money when it with when it appears, you know? And it was like put in make sure to be financially okay and like it's just yeah, it just ended up being that I've had to spend extra money. <laughs> it's just uh it's not what we needed. And we were like, I was trying not to take it too seriously because I didn't, you don't want that card in a reading, mm. especially for your future. No. <laughs> I don't mind if it's in the back, you know, yeah, in the past. past. But yeah, uh, it was just awful. So uh, I'm just going to lighten the mood quickly with a picture, which is my mum's got a brilliant calendar, which is like cosmic animal calendar okay. for this year. Uh, and this is August's uh, picture, which is a chimp. On a vine in space in a galaxy, swirling cosmic galaxy reaching out to planet Earth. Wow. <sighs> Explains a lot. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Chimp reaching out <laughs> to Earth. But yeah, that's, that's our episode. Are you... Are you directing a volcano eruption movie starring <laughs> Sandra Bullock and Renee Zellweger... Are uh, you are you a geologist being called right now to important? Scene? Are you P Pierce Brosnan in hot pants <laughs> skidding up in a jeep? Are you Tommy Lee Jones angrily running around Los Angeles because your movie's so cheap that it has to be set in L.A.? <laughs> are you Vin Diesel uh, steering a helicopter into a boiling caldera of lava? <laughs> <laughs> Or magma. I can't remember which one it is. Let us know. Send your email stories in to us and we are saving them for a rainy day. Yeah. Send them. I'm low energy right now, but we you send them. And we'll tell you all about our fairy cabin that we are creating yeah. and it's going to be great. We're on Twitter. We are on Instagram. We are have a website and everything is there yeah it's go to our website wait worldwearypodcast.com um, yeah if you it, everything's there including how to email us including all our social media including uh how to help us out with brave how to we've got a telegram yeah we're working on doing a discord at some point we've just like opened up every wormhole for you we're to, in it with the crypto stuff we're reaching we out to all of the we're on Friendster. Yeah, we're we're just we're like probably on MySpace by now. Yeah, uh, it's all happening. Yeah, we're the only thing we're not on is Facebook. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can make us Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I'm not touching it. Until next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye.